So, welcome very much to our webinar. Uh, what are we up to? Is this the uh, sixth in our series, the seventh in our series? Um, let me uh, encourage you to register for the webinar series. Most of you, of course, will are here because you have registered and received an email, uh, but we'd like to make sure that we have a list of everybody. Um, and one of the reasons we like to do that is because so we can continue to send you email, um, email updates and provide you with the link both to the webinar and to our web page where you can get access to the recordings of today's webinar and all future webinars. Today's webinar will be posted in uh, sometime afternoon Washington DC time, maybe uh, within four or five hours of the webinar ending. So here's today's program. Uh, I will begin by introducing myself. I'm Elizabeth. I'm sitting here in the World Bank headquarters in Washington, DC. I'm your moderator, and I'm also the task manager for this webinar series. I'm sitting right next to Su Jung Yu, who is uh, controlling the screen here. And I hope that we will have uh, Army uh, helping anybody that needs uh, help um, with technical problems. And if you do, something happens in the course of the webinar, please use this technical chat box at the bottom right side of your screen. Our facilitators today are Kirsten and Sean, who I think are sitting next to each other in a room in Switzerland. And they will be uh, managing your questions and uh, also running the, the um, the question and answer period. Our discussant today is Ventura Benochea. I hope that over the years I've gotten slightly better at pronouncing your last name, Ventura. Ventura is sitting across the street from us here in Web World Bank headquarters in Washington, DC. And then our speaker today is Katarina Fonseca. And although she's based in the Netherlands at IRC, I understand that she's somewhere in the UK uh, giving a training course to uh, water aid this week. So that's just a brief introduction to who we are. And I'll come back and give more uh, detailed introductions. But first, let's find out a little bit about how, who you are. I can see that some of you have already been introducing yourselves but, and what country you're in. But could we just hear um, from all of you about, about where you are or where you're from? I can see we've got some Ethiopia. Oh, Abuja, Nigeria. Um, who else? I saw Southern Florida, Tampa, Florida. That would be a nice place to be. Oh, Senegal. Bienvenue à notre petit webinar. Tunis, great. Tunis, UK. Uh, Tunisia. Well, Tunisia certainly in the news these days. Kent. Uh, oh, Afghanistan. My goodness. I don't think we've ever had a participant from Afghanistan before. Uh, Paris, Uganda, South Africa. I don't remember anybody from South Africa either. Kenya, California, great. Yemen, ooh, Yemen. Oh, I see. You're, you're actually here with us in DC. Uh, Bolivia. OK, well, great. We, we're doing pretty well from around the world. Seem to be a little light on the East Asia group um, today. I don't see anybody from, good. We've got a representation from at least from uh, Eastern Europe. So, Su Jung, could you tell us a little bit about who we've gotten into our webinar series so far? Yes, Elizabeth. Um, we have about 1,200 people registered for the series, webinar series. And today, on our seventh webinar, we have 63 participants attending. OK. Um, great. Uh, so our, our registration has uh, leveled off a little bit. So let me encourage you all to tell your friends and colleagues about this wonderful webinar series so that we can uh, continue att to attract people. We also uh, try and run a weekly uh, poll. And this week, we were trying to learn how people actually found out about the webinar series and actually got the link to it. So if you could uh, look at this and tell us whether you got it because um, uh, you registered and we sent you an email, or maybe a colleague just sent you the link and said, this is this great series, click here, or both, not sure, other. Um, 
let's see what we're getting. So I can see that most of you are getting uh, here because you have gotten emails with us and a few people are being sent the link directly without registering. Well, again, let me uh, encourage you to register for the webinar series because that way we can make sure that you faithfully get an email every single week for until June 12th um, telling you exactly what will be happening and uh, where to go to get more information. So uh, thank you very much and let's continue. So let me now take uh, a minute or two to introduce you to who we have with us today. Whoops. Um, Today's uh, presenter is Katerina Fonseca. She has a master's degree in economics and rural development and 15 years of experience in development cooperation, of which 12 years have been with the IRC Water and Sanitation Center in the Netherlands. Uh, her main areas of expertise include financing and cost recovery, microfinance, and poverty analysis. She is the director of the IRC Wash Cost Project, which runs from 2008 to 2013, and is investigating the costs of providing water, sanitation, and hygiene services to communities in Ghana, Burkina Faso, Mozambique, and India. And that, of course, is why she is here with us today. So without um, further ado, I would like, whoops, I would like to hand the microphone over to you. And pretty soon you will see your slides come up in the correct order. Yes, take it away, uh, Katerina. I'll now mute my mic. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. I would first like to thank the World Bank and the Rural Water Supply Network for organizing and facilitating this webinar series. I also have to thank WaterAid for letting me use their offices here in London, where I am. And to all of you who are listening and interested in our work, uh, we have participants from all over the world, and that's great. The agenda for today's webinar is the following. First, I will explain what are the elements of the life cycle cost approach. Second, I'll provide examples on the use of the approach from the wash cost data. And finally, I'll describe why and how other organizations are using this approach. The work uh, that I'm presenting today is the result of a very large team effort uh, from two projects funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Wash Cost Project and the Water Services at Last, or Triple S. We've been working over the last four years with an incredible team of professionals in five countries. Uh, Elizabeth mentioned some of them, Andhra Pradesh in India, Mozambique, Ghana, Burkina Faso, and Uganda and examples will be provided from these countries, but also from other organizations. So what is the life cycle cost approach? The life cycle cost approach is one way to try and address a problem that we are all very aware of, increasing non-functionality or decreasing service levels in rural water supply. I will focus, this work has been done in rural areas, in urban uh, water and sanitation, but I will focus specifically on rural water supply. These pictures were all taken in the same village in India. You can see different generations of different systems which are not working for a reason or another. The business as usual at the moment means that systems are implemented at a tune of about $10,000 just for drilling a borehole and adding a hand pump in many African countries. And after two or three years, due to lack of follow-up or maintenance, the water service stops altogether when the hand pumps are not fixed. And another organization comes to the same area and builds new systems, and failure, failure happens all over again. We call this slippage because you have rich coverage and then you slip back. The problem with the business as usual approach is that it is costing the sector a lot of money. If we consider that an av on average every year there are 40% of systems not functioning, this is data from the Rural Water Supply Network, then that means that on average every year we are throwing 40% of our investments in the garbage bin. 
that we can change this. We can, after new works and systems are built, make sure that there are people in the districts monitoring post-construction and that there is money available for maintenance. This will keep services at a certain level and stop the slippage. What are the life cycle costs? They are the cost of providing wash service to a specific area, not just for a few years, but indefinitely. And there's an NGO that puts this much better than this in two, two words. It's water for people, and they say the cost of everyone forever. So let's go straight to the cost components. What are the, the cost components? Uh, the first cost we need to consider is well known. It's the lumpy upfront cost of constructing a system, capital expenditure, also known as CAPEX. These costs can be further divided in CAPEX hardware for the infrastructure and CAPEX software for the pre-project assessments, capacity building, setting up community-based organizations, etc. The second cost is also well known. Operation, operational and minor maintenance, or OPEX, mostly known in the sector as O&M. These costs are usually less for communities to pay for. They are minor and are regular recurrent expenditures. The third cost is one of the most important over sustainable systems and has been largely ignored. It's the non-regular, lumpy, unexpected, and costly major maintenance, the breakdown of the generator or the replacement of the iron rods. This is also called capital maintenance, Capmanex or friends, or I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to to use slang in, in webinars, but as the CEO of an organization I have visited recently calls them, it's the oh shit moments. These are costs which in many programs are left for communities to pay, but in most of the cases they are too high and not affordable. The wash cost data collected in Mozambique, for instance, has shown that the average cost of replacement of one hand pump is $2,000. This is more expensive than anyone has thought, and the government and partners are now finding ways to bring this cost down, and most importantly, figuring out who can pay for them and how this can be arranged. The fourth cost component is also largely ignored in rural water supply. It's the human counterpart to capital maintenance. We call them expenditures on direct support. These are the costs of the district staff or NGO or private sector to go and check if systems are still functioning and making sure they are repaired. On the paper, the district staff has several responsibilities. For instance, do regular water quality testing. In practice, these costs are actually never uh, budgeted. We know now from wash cost data and looking into other organizations' costs that direct expenditure should be around two to three dollars per year per person for a decent service. Anything below $1 per person per year will deliver very poor and sustainable services. And all this analysis of several countries is available on the wash cost working paper number five on the website. There are two more cost components, but they tend to be proportionally smaller to the, to the other costs. They are the expenditure on indirect support, these are the costs which cannot be allocated to a specific area or project but need to be taken into account. They are the cost of running the Ministry of Water or the expenditure of headquarters of many of the NGOs, I NGOs, which are also listening to us. The final cost component to be considered are the cost of capital, when, and this is when there are loans or microfinance involved, again, many times ignored, especially in rural water programs. These are six cost components. And it's important to note that the cost by is not proportion, proportional. This is only for uh, illustrative purposes. Each situation and context will have a different breakdown of all of these costs. But when we have dif when when different systems are providing very different service levels, how can we actually compare costs? How we can compare apples with apples? The wash cost team uh, had first to define, well, what is a service then? What is a water service? And we did this by matching the norms and indicators of the different countries we were working with. So in the end, we came up with a framework for ana analyzing, analyzing costs, which consists of five service levels 
in a letter from no service after an intervention, substandard service, a basic, which corresponds to the norms of the countries, intermediate service, and a high service. And we came up with four indicators which describe the service as received by the user. This is very important. And this is quantity, defined as liters per capita per day, quality, depending if water quality testing is done and available and the results, accessibility, measured as the minutes per round trip, which includes both the distance and the crowding, so it's both applicable to rural and peri-urban areas, and the reliability, measured in, min in um, the number of days per year that the system is uh, functional. So it was also later great to realize that these indicators became also included in the human rights framework for water and sanitation, as well as the proposal of the same human rights framework for monitoring progressive realization of services, which can be done with um, a water ladder like this one. In this slide, we have added the JMP status at the end of improved and unimproved. So you can see how the framework relates with the existing uh, coverage monitoring being done. Improved matches with the basic norm and anything uh, above, and an improve below. So basically, water service levels and ladders uh, provide a more granularity to the analysis and goes much further than only considering coverage for defining a service. When we present this, this water service uh, table, there are always many questions on why are some indicators not there. So I like to tell this little story. Four years ago, in wash cost, we started with about a thousand indicators for collecting costs and services for both water, sanitation, and hygiene in rural and peri-urban areas and slum areas. We tested these a thousand indicators we tested them at scale in four countries, and we did more than 10 households, 10,000 household surveys. And this, this is the summary of all these four years of research, of testing indicators, of collecting them, of seeing which ones are reliable, which ones are affordable, which ones are possible to collect at relatively low cost. And that means that, yes, we, we started with a much more complicated and precise criteria and indicators, but this framework presents what's possible at the moment to collect at relatively low cost, except maybe for water quality in some countries where testing is very expensive. So in total, from 1,000 indicators, we have now about 50 core indicators for rural water, both for cost, the cost component, and the service level component. The most important is that this is a very flexible framework for analysis. We can use the same norms for doing international comparisons, but we can also adapt it to the different norms of different countries. For instance, in Latin America, um, if you look at the quantity uh, norm, uh, the, the, in Latin American countries, norms for water quantity are much higher. So for instance, here the basic, it starts at 60 liters. In Ethiopia, they lower the basic, it's 15 liters. So it's, it's a very flexible framework for analyzing data, both at country level and at international level. So this was, Moving on, so this is the, the part of the, where I explain the methodology. But using this framework, I want to now start giving you some concrete examples with data. You see this framework allows very interesting analysis. For instance, here are three common systems used in Mozambique, borehole and hand pump, small pipe system, the well, wells, and the respective levels of service they were providing when we collected the data in the sample. And so in red, you have no service, substandard, and basic. And this is the combined service levels if you look at this, in all of these indicators and all these levels, it gives us this graph. The areas where the sample was collected would indicate that 100% of the sample population was covered by water services. But when we actually look at the four indicators of service, um, only 5%, if you look at here at the green, only 5% of the, the sample population accessed a basic level of service using either a borehole or a small pipe system. So you can see how it keeps us much more between the, the covered and uncovered distinction. Of course, the more localized the analysis and the data, the more interesting it becomes, and also the impact that it can have on policy. 
The framework also allows us to check if some specific groups are being excluded from the services. This map shows the caste groups in a village in Andhra Pradesh in India. Here in the outskirts of the village in green, you can see the location of the lower caste groups and in the center, the better off caste groups. Now, this is actually, I'm using an example from sanitation services. And we looked here, we looked at two of the service level indicators for sanitation, access and use. We can see in the map that in the lower caste areas, there are many households without toilets. These are in red, so these are the households without toilets. But even worse, we can see in yellow, the households which have a toilet, but are not using it. And it's very interesting because these are not just the lower caste areas, but there's also, not exclusively, you also have the other um, castes uh, with, with not a full service. And we can do the same uh, for water, so different levels of analysis and granularity. I don't have time to show you all the results on cost and service levels. They are available in the research outputs in the website. But in this second section, uh, section, I will show some examples of what we found and what you can do using the methodology. I have presented the two main components of the life cycle cost so far, the cost component on one hand and the service levels. So how do we bring them together and why would we want to do that? We want to bring both the service ladder and, and the levels and the costs, these are the cost pi representing the cost together, mainly to calculate how much does it cost to receive a specific level of service or to go from one to another. Can we be more efficient with our investment? Can we get more value for money? With wash costs, we had the resources and we had to prove that this was a proof of concept and the methodology and we collected existing costs and service levels and we also looked back for each of the countries um, for different uh, agroclimatic regions within those countries because we wanted to capture different systems in these different contexts. This table shows the sample for rural water and most of the service level pop indicators were collected with household surveys. Most of the cost data, on the other hand, had to be extracted and calculated with key informant interviews. There was very little cost information available or to aggregate it across the four countries, but we have to start somewhere and I think this is a key message as well for you. Even if it's little or incomplete cost data, it's better than no cost data at all. Now, this table shows the water systems we found in each of the countries. We have here the most common ones, the borehole uh, with the manual, manual and with the hand pump, mechanized borehole, single visual scheme, multi-village scheme, and mixed pipe supply. As you can see, well, in green, are the systems where we had enough cost data and service level data to make comparisons. Here in red, we did not have relevant uh, cost data to start making comparisons. So these are all very country specific and region specific. So I'm presenting uh, aggregated comparable information, but they, are, they make most sense in, in those countries, in those areas. But as you can see, I'm go I start with a complicated case. In Andhra Pradesh, there is a, actually a mix of systems and they can be found many times within the same village. So what happens when, for instance, in Andhra Pradesh, we put together the costs and the service levels? A small aside, I know this is not easy. It's not too easy to visualize and we, were, we are working on better ways to visualize costs and service levels. And while we have not found a better way, let me explain slowly what you're looking at. On the left-hand side, we have the percentage of the sample population. These columns represent the service levels in each of the agroclimatic zones of Andhra Pradesh. So in red is no service, here blue is substandard, and we go into green, it's the, the basic service level. Then we added to this graph the capital expenditure per person on the right-hand side. For each region, we have the service levels in the columns and um, the capital expenditure represented by the black dots. 
This is very aggregated data, but you can see that independently of the infrastructure, and I'm picking the worst case scenario here, South Tulangama, um, we can see that there are areas in this area, there are 70% of the population has no service, and the cost per person per year is more than $100. Concluding, my point is that there's very low levels of service can be very costly. We were also interested, so this is capital investment in infrastructure, but we were also interested in looking at the level of recurrent expenditure and if there was any relationship with the level of services delivered. In this graph, you can see the percentage of users with the basic service level in sampled areas of the four countries, Andhra Pradesh, Burkina Faso, Ghana, and Mozambique. The size of the bubble shows the amount of recurrent expenditure per person per year in US dollars, and the colors represent the different systems used to deliver water. So the pink is single village scheme, the blue is mechanized borehole, purple mixed pipe supply, and here these little orange dots are boreholes with hand pumps. There's also in green the multi village scheme. Um, so we can see that the more complex, more complex systems with higher maintenance do not necessarily provide better levels of service. For instance, I'm taking again the Andhra Pradesh, which is a more complicated case. There, there is a lower percentage of users being provided with the basic service by a single village scheme, this red bubble, spending $3 per person per year on recurrent expenditure against this little orange dot, which represents a basic service provided by a borehole and hand pump with a recurrent expenditure of one cent per person per year. So there is, as I said, I just wanted to present you some of the nice things that you can do with putting together cost and service levels, and there's a wealth of data available on the website. But a lot of people ask uh, for what we found on capital costs of boreholes with hand pumps. So I want to show you one final graph with cross-country comparisons. As you can see, this is the, the costs, current costs. This is in purchasing power parity. Just focus on this first column on the blue. Um, costs in Andhra Pradesh are considerably lower than the other three countries at $2,000 when both household expenditure and government expenditure are added. So this amounts to $2,000, while the other countries we have the extreme, Burkina Faso, $1,200, and uh, $8,000 for the other countries. We also looked at cost drivers, because you can ask, well, why is this different for each of the cost components? But they are too context-specific, uh, varying from cost of labor, cost of transport, local markets, or material use, materials used for construction. In short, they are unquantifiable, and the key lesson from this is that costs cannot be extrapolated from one country to another, even when they share borders. There's many local economies for many of the components of a system. So what are some of the implications of what I just presented for the sector uh, from all the data that we found? The first one is that Shifting from delivering a technology to deliver services has significant programmatic implications for the sector. Changes in the mindset and in the design, the scale, the timing of contractual arrangements, and we, we keep wondering what is the trigger, what can be done to speed up the changes in the business as usual approach. The challenge of post-construction, the expenditure on direct support and capital maintenance, they are just not happening. How can the sector finance this? The third point, related with the questions above, who is really accountable for sustainability? Not for the four, five years of implementation of programs, but for 10, 20 years, forever. We can discuss some of these questions later, but it is important to note that for delivering change, understanding costs and using them for better planning and budgeting is necessary, but as we all know, not sufficient. The third and final part of the presentation relates with the examples of use by other organizations which are not collecting historical or past costs, but are using a life cycle cost for planning and monitoring. At the moment, there are already many organizations and governments using components of this, this approach. We are aware of at least 50 organizations the, around the world using 
either the cost components or the service levels or both. And this is a nice map where you can see, I like to see Australia here in the corner, and well, all around the world. The little stars are the organizations and countries which are already using, and the red Los Angeles are the organizations and governments who are planning uh, to use it. Most of them are NGOs and governments, but in terms of allocation of funds to the sector, linking cost and service levels and actually making policy and budgetary changes has much more potential for impact when they are taken up by governments and development banks because of the size of the expenditures. For instance, just to give you a quick example, um, the government of Ghana has included some of the components of the life cycle cost within their district monitoring and evaluation system, they call it the DIMES, uh, to become a national monitoring system. And there are, at the moment, district working groups discussing how to finance capital maintenance and direct support with the aim of increasing sustainability. They went through the most difficult step, which is actually to calculate how much this would cost and now trying to figure out how to finance it. But this looks overwhelming and a lot of things that, that, that might look difficult. But if you are an NGO, you can also start by simply looking at your financial books and understanding the life cycle costs of your service delivery model. This is 2010, an NGO, the Fontes Foundation in Uganda, they have done this. You can see in this graph that this aggregated four cost components, uh, CAPEX, capital expenditure, capital maintenance expenditure, O&M, operational expenditure, and the expenditure on direct support. And this is from one of their water projects over a period of seven years. You can see here, so this is the infrastructure construction, and then it goes down after year one. But you see here, after five years, there was a generator that broke down and had to be replaced. Well, this is one of those oh shit moments that I mentioned before. And it's the peak of capital maintenance expenditure, which is also accompanied by an increase in the support, in the direct support that you see here. This methodology has enabled this NGO, for instance, to understand better their recurrent expenditures and plan better for the unexpected expenditures. We have asked some of the users of the methodology what had triggered them to use it. And these last two slides sum up what early adopters have said. Well, first, the first one, the biggest trigger is a non-functionality in the, in the area side. How can I increase functionality with a better understanding of cost? The second one, there are a lot of investments on infrastructure, but resulting services are low. Can we get more value for money? So even when systems are functioning, can we get higher service levels than what we're getting now? This is common also for NGOs. The donor says it's too expensive. Can I show that my program is actually cost effective? For governments, for banks, um, they want to monitor sustainability. What are the best indicators? which are also relevant, affordable, measurable, comparable. This one, the first one is actually happens the most in sanitation. So my organization is using different approaches um, with different service delivery models, and I want to see which one is more cost efficient. For governments, as, as district government, I need to ensure the maintenance of existing infrastructure. How can I calculate who will pay how much, for what, and when. And as local government, I need to plan, budget, and monitor what services. Can you help me with that? And perhaps there's many more which are, we are still not aware and we would love to hear from you. And with this slide, I would like to thank you for listening and handing over to Elizabeth. Uh, thank you very much. And our participation has topped 100, which makes this the largest uh, webinar we've ever run. I do notice that a few people are, have been logged in twice. That may interfere with the sound quality. Uh, you, you may be getting a kind of echo. So if that's the case, I suggest that you log out of uh, one time and, and only be logged in once. We're also, um, let me reassure you, Sean and Kirsten are doing a great job behind the scenes keeping track of all of the questions and comments you've been typing into the chat box. So please continue to do that, and we will address them in the um, question and answer 
period that will be coming shortly. But first now, let's hear from our discussant, Ventura, who we're very pleased to have um, with us today. I'm shifting through my papers because I lost the beautiful, oh, here we go, the beautiful introduction that I have to Ventura. Ventura holds a civil engineering diploma from Spain and an MSc, E, and MBA degrees from the USA. In addition to his normal duties, he's been actively involved with several professional organizations and is an honorary member of the American Water Works Association. Prior to joining the bank, Ventura worked for a U.S. engineering consulting firm for nearly 15 years. Since joining the World Bank in 1993, Ventura, Ventura has managed projects in Mexico, Honduras, Costa Rica, Dominican Republic, Venezuela, Guyana, Peru, Paraguay, Argentina, Indonesia, Burundi, Ghana, Guinea, Liberia, and Senegal, among others. Ventura recently returned from Ghana after managing there for three and a half years, um, several different projects dealing with water sanitation, solid waste, and other infrastructure activities. But of most interest to us today is that Ventura managed the bank's rural water supply and sanitation project in Ghana, to which uh, Katharina has already made some uh, references. This is uh, probably, if not the largest, then one of the largest rural water and sanitation projects that the bank presently has in Africa. And I believe that Ventura worked very closely with the IRC wash cost team while he was in Ghana. So Ventura, I now turn the microphone over to you. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth. And greetings to, to everybody. Uh, to me, it's very hard to be a discussant on a topic that uh, sounds like music to my ears. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid that if participants suspect that I will challenge the presenter, uh, they might be disappointed. But um, I, I can see that there are many you know, comments which uh, probably are much more interesting than mine. So I'm, I'm just going to do you know, a few remarks and probably just to uh, emphasize uh, some, some of the things that the presenter uh, has, has uh, brought us. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to emphasize this need for a change in mindset. And, and this uh, change in mindset is from construction to management. Uh, although uh, Elizabeth kindly said that I am, uh, you know, working with a large project in rural water and sanitation, as, as I did, I, I did most of my life, professional life, involved with large uh, water utilities. And, uh, you know, many of them, many part, hello? Could I um, interrupt you just for a minute? Your mic is just a bit too close to your mouth. If you could move your mic a little bit farther away from your mouth, I think it would improve the sound quality. Good. Uh, let, me, let me try now, and uh, please interrupt me if, I, if, if it doesn't sound good. So, as, as I was saying, uh, many of these uh, large uh, water utilities have in their denomination, the word works. And works because they were basically involved in the construction of systems that they didn't, they didn't exist. Uh, so, so water construction, water treatment facilities, networks, uh, storage reservoirs, etc. And I, 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 I have uh, the feeling that now every large water utility is very concerned about management of existing assets, uh, replacement, etc. But now moving into the rural water supply, it looks like, uh, you know, we have come like uh, 20, 50 years behind, you know, some of these uh, investments were made in, uh, in urban areas. And here, you know, the challenge is number one, because there are still a lot of construction to, to be done, but the interventions are scattered over the, the, the geographical area of the country. Uh, there is usually little technical capacity available as compared to, you know, large water utility. And the communities are very poor usually, so, so there is not you know, much, much money to, to, you know, to, to be available. 
So I have to say that uh, in most countries, or in many countries, uh, well, the governments uh, have done the, the right things that, uh, that is to establish uh, some national agencies that you know have been concerned with how to expand uh, the facilities, how to provide technical and financial uh, support. And, and the success uh, based upon just the, you know, the, the latest JNP uh, reports for the Millennium Development Goals is that a lot has been done in, in, that, in that regard. But looking at uh, Katrina's uh, you know, charts, it's, it's really mind-blowing uh, just to see uh, how the levels of service, how the, the actual service of the facilities uh, decrease or even you know, totally stop you know, after after a short time. So uh, here is, is the emphasis on the change of mind. I, I always keep saying that uh, the uh, water services uh, and, and all the, the projects uh, we all are involved with, they, they start uh, instead of ending the moment that we finish the construction of the facilities. And this, this is again something that uh, has to be entered into everybody's uh, you know, uh, mind, and especially how to convert this financial and technical support that uh, was extremely necessary and still is necessary to keep expanding uh, the, the, the coverage of, uh, of rural you know, water supply and sanitation to how to uh, emphasize management. And as Katrina said, who is responsible for that? Who is responsible for the sustainability? So, so here are, here are the, the, the challenges. We need to uh, basically re-educate uh, our agencies into looking into that. Now, the challenges are obvious, again, how to reach you know, people that uh, geographically are, are very far, um, there are very poor communities, etc. So what I, what I would like to, to hear, because I, I think there are many comments uh, coming on that, is how to do that. Now, the opportunities that we have today are, for example, the, the, the good coverage that we have of um, mobile phone technology uh, that uh, allows us to, to get information at least you know record information and react to things that are happening so 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 i i would like to you know to hear you know plenty of comments on that you know how to do that one one of the you know things that i would like i guess to 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 finalize to to highlight is again this that is still a fantastic uh, you know way of representing in this pie that the capital cost is just a small portion of the total costs that any any government uh, will have to to face, and and again here you know we need some ideas to to see how we can really provide these capital maintenance funds, uh, which should be you know come as much as possible from from the communities, but. Uh, it's, it's also been challenging to, you know, keep some money in a box to be utilized uh, three, five, ten years from now, because this money uh, tends to be better, you know, for more immediate uh, needs. And uh, so, so there, there is a need to, to build some, some sort of a, of a, of a system that, uh, you know, really, you know, makes uh, this money be available uh, into some some box you know out of the of, of the easy reach of, of the hand and like that and there are there are I know there are many ideas over there so so I would like uh, you know to to stop here and I would like to uh, you know hear uh, from uh, you know many of the participants about you know good 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 ways to uh, basically uh, uh, you know uh, target uh, this challenge of how to make sure that the systems are functioning, that uh, you know, there is good information coming about that, there is a good benchmarking within the country and uh, you know, from country to country in order to, at the end of the day, make sure that all this money 
that uh, is being put into capital investments. Do not go into the trash can that uh, we saw in the slide, but really it uh, is, is going to make the systems uh, that last uh, forever as, as they should. So I will stop here and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Ventura. Um, now we're going to go to the question and answer period. Unfortunately, we know from experience that we'll only get to a small portion of the questions. But can, Sujung, can I now ask you to bring out the Q&A uh, pod where we will post the questions? And I will turn this over to our facilitators, uh, Sean and Kirsten, who have been working very diligently behind the scenes to keep track of your questions. I'm muting my mic now. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, and it's great to see so many people on, and thank you again, Katerina, for such an interesting and enlightening presentation. Um, one question I have here from Fatuma Sangare, who, who asks a very pertinent question, which is, why is there no cost data in these countries, and, and what are the challenges? I hand over to you, Katerina. Thank you, Kirsten and Elizabeth and Ventura for your from for your comments from your experience. I've also noticed that there's a lot of participants having sound problems, but I just want you to assure you that everything has been recorded and you can listen afterwards to, to the recording. Why there is no cost data in these countries exactly? <laughs> um, I think because no one was looking, no one was asking, no one was monitoring, no one needed them. And if, if there's a cycle of build, deliver service, go away to the next region, forget and, and keep this cycle, why would you need sustainable or, or data related with sustainability on services or on costs? Um, so it was, a couple, when we started, it was because no, not many people were looking. And then when we started bringing this up and, 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 and that especially the district officers, our, our counterparts in the government start seeing the power of having this data and how it can actually change the way things are being done and now also NGOs and, 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 and donors. Um, once people see the power of having information, they will start looking for it and collecting it. Great. Thank you, Katerina. Um, thank you for an excellent presentation. Um, the next group of questions is around methods and results. So, Anita in Ireland asks, how many years would you normally assess life cycle costs over? And then Mark has asked, how often during a calendar year do you collect information on quantity, quality, accessibility and reliability as it can change seasonally and due to different demands? And then finally, Bishnu has asked, could it be possible to determine the percentage of the total life cycle costs, for example, capex life cycle costs for a hand pump and other technology options. Well, thank you for for this question. It's it's. I'm glad you're asking these questions. Um, how many years would you normally access? Uh, well, given the fact that uh, there's not many organ, there's very few organisations who started doing this. Collecting at least one would be great. Um, once a year, uh, depending on your on your programs and your monitoring systems, but I th I would think once a year would would be relevant. Um, how often during the calendar year? I mean, again, the the life cycle cost approach is a framework of analysis. It provides some tools and some costing components and service levels for monitoring and checking uh, some some of the things that contribute to sustainability. So they should as much as possible be integrated within local planning and monitoring. So it's, if depending on the calendar of monitoring of, the, of a specific district, that's one they should be collected. Um, and yes, there are consequences of this for checking, for instance, quantity of dry season or, or rainy season. Um, but what matters is that some of this information and these indicators can be asked retroactively as well. So if you have the amount of resources to go and collect twice in a year, great, but if you don't, you can ask retroactively. And people remember, people know more or less how much water they have in one season or another. 
again, when there's nothing, it's better to have something, even if it's not very, very detailed. And could it be possible to determine the percentage of total life cycle costs? Um, this is possible, and the percentages are possible, but it really is context specific. We found amazing differences within countries. Even with three, within the same agroclimatic zone, we found differences. So there is not a blueprint. There is not, oh, I mean, I agree with Ventura. CAPEX, capital expenditure, is the lowest, it's probably our lowest expenditure because it's a one off within the whole uh, life cycle cost. The others are recurrent and every year. So you would need to have an idea how much this should be in each specific area. Thank you, Katerina. As, as you can hear, Sean and I are corresponding between the two of us as to these questions, so forgive us if there's a tiny delay. I'm going to put the third question to you, and actually, I hope it's big enough for you all to read. A lot of people have been asking about aspects of community participation, and it would be good to clarify that a little bit further. So from, from Fatuma Sangare, Fatumata Sangare, who points out the importance of community involvement, and that this community involvement should start way before the project is implemented. And Kichimwe Bawa, who points out that depending on the context, the cost implications and involvement of the community can be changed among these components, your six components. Bade Olukun from Nigeria, who points out that it appears that the development in government agencies continue to manage the systems after initial initialization, installation. And how do communities participate or own the water supplies within your life cycle costing approach? And linking to, to, to that, the next question from Dayo Olugboye, who asks, how do we achieve post-implementation sustainability where communities are completely responsible for driving functionality without any form of external support? It's quite a provocative question. Let me hand over to you, Katrina, for this set of four questions. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, thank you for the questions again. I will start with the, with the final one, with the last question. There's very, very few examples of communities which have totally been achieving post-implementation sustainability on their own, and they are in relatively well-off countries and or in some pockets of very empowered Latin American countries. This is the exception, is not the norm. The norm is that there's a government responsible for services to their population, like we in all the, the countries in the world. And the fact that it's rural water and that we are saying, well, yes, I agree, community involvement is very, very important. But it can't be a delegation of also financial responsibility, saying that after three years, four years, oh, the community handles it, and we take out all support, is just not sustainable. Um, someone needs to be checking on the water quality, or if the system is operational, or if the private sector is there to actually provide spare parts. Someone needs to do this, and it's not the community who will be doing this. We, we have examples now over the last 20 years that this, this does not work. Um, so it's O&M, costs on minor operation and maintenance, yes, communities can cover for it. Capital maintenance, replacement of large components of the systems, we've done this, this large cost um, analysis and for rural water, the capital maintenance is very high and communities cannot pay for it. They, it's just not possible. So, of course, I'm not generalizing. I'm talking about the samples of the four countries where we worked in. Uh, and that's the best data we have. Um, over to the next question. OK, well, the um, next question is about water quality. And uh, Sharad in Indonesia. Um, I think it refers to one of your slides where you have uh, water quality is as measurable as good, acceptable, problematic. Um, and she makes the point that it's not a naked eye judgment and um, it's difficult to uh, measure without field t testing kits. And, and Slava in, in Ukraine uh, adds to this point by saying that it, in many cases water quality 
is uh, a standard is either met or or it isn't. So, uh, how how do you uh, deal with these sort of issues around water quality? Water quality was the indicator where the norms were the the most different in all of the countries uh, where we were working, and. Um, there, for instance, I'm going to give you two very contrasting ones. In India, there's private labs, there's uh, public labs. You can have water quality checks uh, for 15 different parameters. In Mozambique, in some of the areas where we're doing data collection, there was no way the water sample could get to a lab uh, for, for water quality checking. So it's, it's an extremely context-specific indicator and as it's mentioned um, by one of the, the commenters, it either meets the standard or not. So this is very much an indicator which needs to meet the standard of the country where, where you collect data. And the best way that we could come up with a kind of an international comparison is, well, it's not good, it's acceptable, or it's OK. Um, and then inside that, and for each country, that means many different things. But we could not come up with uh, one single, even the, the most basic accepted one, which is the E. coli, um, it was not possible to collect in many of the countries. Over. Thanks, Ka <laughs> Thanks, Katarina. It's like being on one of these great radio stations on, on, a, on a kind of film over, over and out. Right, let me come in with the next question. Um, and this relates to your point of who is kind of accountable for a sustainability. And a comment from Joe Gom and a question from Jonathan Annis. So Joe Gom says, one of the major problems is the reluctance of organizations with funding to provide long-term commitment to sustaining services. Donor organizations are usually needed to support the setup costs of systems, but no one wants to say that they will stay there for 20 years. And Jonathan follows that with a pertinent question, and he asks, what examples in the development context do we have that come close to the forever model? And are there any countries in Africa that have put together many aspects of the framework? Over to you. Thank you. This is, this is I think, the, one of the biggest battles of, of many of us working in the sector. Um, and we, we are all used, I mean, I live in the Netherlands and in Portugal. Um, we expect a forever model. I don't expect that suddenly my water quality goes down or suddenly I don't have, only have water three months of the year. You, you, you just assume that. So it's very interesting to, to notice that for the rural water, there is not a forever model. Um, the examples in the development context come very much from very new um, and recent ex experiences and from this mindset change. And Water for People is one of the organizations which is most vocal about it to everyone forever. But I've been having over the last three months, I think we are really close to a tipping point. I've been talking with donor agencies, the, the most, the largest ones, the, the, the most powerful ones, all the way from the US, Europe, and Australia. And they are thinking about this, and they are thinking how to do it. And I cannot disclose, but I think within the next coming months, we're going to have a very, very large tipping point on, on actually uh, contracts, which mentioned that even if the contract with the donor agency is just for five years, then the organizations are responsible for the next 10 or 20 years. And it will be fascinating to see the impact that it has uh, on the quality of the services we are delivering. Over. Okay, the, the uh, next question uh, is, oh, sorry, should have copied across but didn't. Let's try that again. Is about how to get more involved. Ah, whoa, that went wrong. Let's try that again. So, um, Wahid Bakeri from Lagos is, it would like to do some life cycle costs for sanitation facilities in, in Lagos. Um, and it, Kirsten asked uh, how people can get involved in the um, life cycle costing working groups. Um, thank you for, for this question and for the interest. Um, in the countries where IRC works, 
um, at, so at the moment we are in the last year of, of the WASHCOS program and we the uptake and the replication has been very very fast so we're trying to finalize the last research uh, components all the poverty analysis and at the same time supporting as many organizations as we can to roll out the methodology that's why for instance I'm here at WaterAid in London um, in the meantime we have put all of the materials the training materials the, um, the working papers the data is all online we understand that it's a difficult it's a it's a steep learning curve you need to, to read a lot and absorb a lot so we expect by the summer to have two more things online one is a guided tutorial we're using this learning environment this web learning environment where you can go step by step and have support also from the, the wash cost team in answering some of your questions. The other one is that we're trying to facilitate the analysis part of the cost. So we're trying to put a very cool, nice app online where you can just put some of your costs and service levels and immediately have kind of a sustainability check and um, a cost calculation uh, per year, per person, uh, per household, etc. So we hope I can't promise, but I hope that by the end of the summer, by the beginning of the summer, we will have some better versions, and by the end of the summer, we probably have the functional uh, versions of some of these tools to really support the uptake. In the meantime, contact anyone from IRC, either in the countries where we're working, or myself. Um, yeah, my, my mail is available everywhere. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katerina. Let me come to the next question. Gosh, we're really we're getting on really well here with the questions, which is fantastic. Uh, we now have one at, about cost effectiveness, and in fact, there's some other people who've been commenting on on really using this life cycle costing approach to improve the cost effectiveness of programs. So Sharad Adi Kari from Indonesia asks how to control cost effectiveness of rural water supplies. We may need to link or to use discount costing for actual efficiency of systems and, and service levels. And he wants to know more really about using this to, to improve the cost effectiveness of programs and projects. Over to you. Thank you. Um, we, we try to, to use the most simple possible financial analysis. We don't do economical analysis. We don't do cost benefit. We just do purely cost expenditure analysis. And the way to do this in a very simple and actually very effective way was to come up with a framework for service levels. So you can see in a lot of the programs where we work, it was very shocking to see the amount of investments put in in an improvement of a service. And actually, you are in the no service area. You know, delivering less than five liters per person is not of acceptable quality. It's more than 60 minutes to access uh, the source. So it's thinking about cost effectiveness in terms of the services delivered, it's already a long way. And going from a no service to below basic to basic, we also we have not yet a full um, statistically valid analysis for this, but we are finding that it's not linear, it's actually exponential. It takes a huge amount of effort to go from one service level to another. And as you all know, it's not just about cost, it's about the institutions and the management and the whole structure uh, behind it. I don't know if this answers the question, but I, I see, because I see all the questions coming in, so I'm trying to, and I see the time, and I'm trying to, to speed up. Um, uh, you're, you're doing very well indeed. Uh, and let me just come on, this is Elizabeth again, to encourage people to continue to uh, post their questions. As I said, um, Kirsten and Sean are doing a great job of uh, fielding the questions and organizing them behind the scenes. And I misspoke earlier. In fact, Kirsten is in Cairo and Sean is in Switzerland, so they're managing to do all of this um, without being able to speak to each other. So, uh, uh, Sean, do you want to bring up the next question? And meanwhile, please, right. please Thanks, go. Elizabeth. So the next question is from Sally Sutton, who asks, how do you decide whether a technical solution is affordable to a community or household? What is the balance in the life cycle cost to be made between users with finite means and governments with other priorities? We see more ways to assume that one can fill the gaps uh, for the other, but there must be a point where a given delivery service is not affordable to either. Oh, 
Oh, hi, Sally. Um, I, I, I fully agree. Um, we, we don't always assume that that communities of governments uh, can can fill in the gap. I mean, this is where um, aid and the the other T, so not not the tariffs, not the taxes. It has to be transfers uh, can fill in the gap. Um, yeah, and and where given the delivery service is not affordable, especially in in post conflict countries, sometimes this is the case, and in other cases it's simply, as you mentioned, not a priority, and then it has nothing to do with costs. As I said, there's a whole other political economy, institutions, and management that need to be taken into account. Over. Thanks, Katerina. Um, I mean, following on from Sally's question, I think I can imagine one of the things that's underlying her question is the whole issue of self-supply and different approaches. Is there anything that maybe you have to say about that, just to build on that last question? Yes, I mean, I could not show I could not show a nice graph about what we call the danger zone. So what we can see in terms of costs over time is that in countries with very little coverage, um, of course, more capital investments are needed. But the more you increase the coverage, and when you start reaching the 70, 80 percent coverage levels, we start seeing first the decrease in capital expenditure and the need for increasing maintenance. But even in some cases, it's not about cost. It's about those last 10, 15 percent of the population which are really difficult to reach in remote areas or specific conditions. And, and for those, then I think when we reach this stagnation point on coverage, which is not about coverage, which is, about, which is not about cost, which is about something else, that's where self-supply, that's where multiple services also come to play uh, the largest role. It's for the most dispersed, the most further away, difficult to reach. Over. Thanks, Katerina. Very interesting. I think there's a scope for a massive discussion just on that. But I'm going to keep continuing with all the questions um, from the participants here. Oops, and I've just taken the wrong question. Excuse me, everybody. OK. So here a question from Stephen Hugman. Um, when designing the original investment, is it possible to consider life cycle costing, including amortization of the capital equipment and income, to evaluate cash flow and returns on investment as it's used for small business development? So here you're being pushed even further with your life cycle costing for, for businesses. I hand over to you, Ken. Thank you. I mean, this is what it's all about, right? You need to understand your costs, and then you can actually get your revenue models and your service delivery model. But what's happening at the moment is that we are discussing financing mechanisms, taxes, tariffs, transfers, and we don't even know how much it costs. So I fully agree with you. But at the moment in the sector, I mean, this is what you're suggesting. It's, it's not even possible, because in many of the countries, there's just not the, the cost data available. Right, the next question is from, uh, if we just paste it in there, come on, from Martin Lemonger. Um, what do you think about the Steffi approach, uh, which was launched in Mali several years ago? Maybe financing monitoring is the first step to increase sustainability. The Steffi approach, I was, it was amazing to find out about it. Um, and I just wish that many of the documents would be translated into English. Um, so it's um, it's very very interesting how it's done within the several regions of Mali, and and how indeed you start by financing by by monitoring how much is being spent and where is being spent and how much is needed. I fully agree with you, Martin. Um, the first step to do any financing, to do any sustainability check, is just to understand how much are you spending right now and what is the gap towards um, having more sustainable services. Thanks, Catherine. I have to say you're doing so well at giving concise answers to the question that you're really giving us a challenge of trying to get the next question up and ready. So thanks a lot for that. It's fantastic. Okay, next question from Bishnu Timalsina. 
Um, for the large projects, life cycle costing approaches might work. But for community managed schemes, if we consider the whole cost of the scheme, considering the life cycle costing approach, the service charge to be raised by the community might go up and it might not be affordable for the poor. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about this whole issue of life cycle costing and affordability, particularly with this life, with the affordability dimension of the human rights to water. Over to you, Katerina. Bishu, very, very good question. Um, the life cycle cost is, is for any project, large, small. What needs to be considered is what are the costs, the different cost components for, for the first one, two, three years, and how much will be needed for year five, year five to ten, year ten to twenty. Once you know how much is needed per person per year, you then check, you can check immediately on the affordability. But I want to add something here. It's not just the affordability for the community. As Sally was mentioning, it's the affordability to the local government. So even if a community can pay for O&M, the district might not be able to, to actually have even salaries or, or a bicycle to go and check if the systems are working. And then your, your sustainability is compromised. So affordability very much, but I, I keep pushing for this point that it's just not affordability for the poor within the communities, it's affordability for the districts. And that's the whole area on direct support, which is critical uh, to, to have data on and to start understanding better. Over. Right, the next question uh, from David Winder is, uh, how do you factor in the costs of ensuring wash systems are resilient to extreme weather conditions such as hurricanes and floods? So this is going quite deep into, into the costs, into the cost components and the analysis of costs. And I think this would be part of your pre in investments and pre-infrastructure um, analysis and what would you need to have to be able to to have wash systems resilient. I mean sometimes I I have I have only heard in, in training courses about participants in, especially in the Southeast Asia when they have a lot of floods and for sanitation systems. Um, I mean, the lifespan was about a year, so they would build a latrine, and after a year, there's floods. So to, then you need to think, shall we put more costs on capital infrastructure so they're stronger and they're more resilient, and, the, and then they, they would need probably less maintenance? Or we start up front with lower investment costs and higher maintenance? Um, I mean, this is, again, it's to check the cost against what's supportable for the context and the situation. And I'm aware that a colleague, Charles Batchelor, wrote something about uh, life cycle costs and, and climate change. So I can try to, in the, in the written answers that I will have to give to this question, I will try to find the reference uh, for that. Thank you, David. Over. Maybe um, before... Kim Thank you very much. Me, ah, just, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I just thought I'd quickly say that we have another five minutes for questioning, and then I'll give the um, microphone over to Ventura to have a few closing uh, comments. So we'll go until about 10.50. So I'm um, sorry to interrupt so rudely. Please continue. No problem. Thanks, little Elizabeth. OK, next question from Lindert. And this is a very difficult to name to pronounce. So this J, yeah, I think I won't bother, but Lindert. And he's asking a very pragmatic question about this life cycle costing approach. And is there a spreadsheet that can help to add all the figures that are required to get a good idea about these life cycle costs? Over to you, Katerina. Thank you. It's Lendert Faisalar, and I guess from the Netherlands. Um, there is a spreadsheet, ex except that there is not a spreadsheet. It's about 10. Uh, if, you, if you actually look at past historical costs, you need to, to put all the costs into present, current uh, values. Um, so this is, there is, and I can share that with you if you, if you send me a, an email. Um, but that's why we're trying to do the cool app. So it's kind of a calculator, so you can just put in your, your cost data and it comes out with the results without having to go through a, a, a rather complex uh, Excel sheet. And the briefing note 1A 
explains how to put all of this together, explains it in step by step. Over. Great. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Jonathan Annis, who asks, does WASH cost collect data about user satisfaction with their water service? Thank you. Um, user satisfaction was one of the initial 1,000 indicators, which was part of the service level. And, but user satisfaction is usually related with the other indicators, with quantity, with quality, with reliability. And so it, if you don't have anything else, it can be an okay-ish proxy indicator. Um, but it's, yeah, it is better to collect the, the other indicators. If you, if, you, if you have to choose, I would go for the other ones. If you can add that to your questionnaire, then just add them. Over. Thanks, Katarina. Last name that I can actually pronounce, Andrei Olszewski asks, how will inflation or currency fluctuations be considered in this life cycle costing analysis? Over. Um, inflation affects um, in two ways. It affects the future cost. So if you are if you are planning for your cost, if you're collecting real cost now and you want to project how much is your expenditure, you need to take the inflation inflation rates of your of your country into account. There are some really good uh, case studies from Mozambique in the Mozambique part of the site. They are in Portuguese, but the graphs you, in it's there. You can see very nicely how an inflation of 10% have a huge impact uh, on costs. But you also have to look at past inflation. And when you, that's why when you're collecting costs, for instance, from 2000, 2005, you need to take out inflation to have your current costs. And you need to, yeah, to, to bring them to the present current value which you, you are using. So you need to pay attention to inflation, both past and future. Over. Great, thank you, Katharina. L very last question, you've done so well. And so the last one comes from uh, Adisef Amado from Ethiopia, who's now at WEDEC. And his question is, commodity value of water and its economic implications are not well recognized in rural communities. And the, and the tariff of water is still very low. How do you address community awareness towards the ability to pay and willingness to pay attitudes in rural areas? Thank you. Well, I'm, I'm sure there's much more NGOs and participants out there with a lot more experience on community mobilization um, and awareness. What we find is even when you have, the, the, the real issue is, are there alternative sources or not? When there, there's no alternative sources, it's easier to do this. It's easier to say, well, this is how much going to cost uh, the tariff to cover the maintenance of the system, etc. When there are alternative sources, it's very easy. Even when there's awareness and uh, there's willingness to pay and ability to pay, even so, we see a lot of cases. It's, it, then it comes the whole behavioral change and hygiene comes into play. Um, and so in wash costs, we did water, sanitation, and the most difficult part is the hygiene. We already have published one briefing note also to have kind of a service um, leather for hygiene interventions. Um, and I think, it, I think that comes in here. So it's not so much having the economic implications, but actually having an idea of how not to revert to polluted uh, sources. Over. Thank you. Let me, this is Elizabeth again. Uh, I think that we have to bring the question and answer period to a close uh, in order to ensure that we end on time. Thank you very much, uh, Sean and Kirsten. Very well managed session. And of course, to you, come up with all of the answers. Ventura, let me turn to you and see if you have some final words or comments that you would like to make. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Elizabeth and, uh, and uh, Katarina. I mean, this has been a very, very informative. And, uh, you know, just uh, related to the, the last question about uh, affordability, um, I mean, you know, to emphasize how hard is this thing, it's uh, is that uh, there have been a lot of 
you know, bad or I would say perverse practices in the past, uh, you know, were by people in urban areas, and particularly in the, in the wealthier neighborhoods, you know, have been receiving all the services, uh, definitely the capital costs uh, for free, and, and even they have been subsidized in the operation and maintenance. So, so now, I mean, we, you know, suddenly we are going to the poor rural communities and, you know, we pretend that uh, people have to pay and, and there is no other way to do it. So, uh, the, you know, the, the paradigm here is that, uh, you know, in some countries they say, well, you know, if we bid for the rich, we have to bid for the poor. But, uh, you know, that is not affordable even to the country. And I always, you know, try to say that uh, uh, here in the, in the U.S., you know, where, where, I, where I live, um, you know, the, 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 there is a lot of lobbying, and there was a lot of lobbying for, for some years, um, uh, that uh, the, there is a need to, you know, the government to provide like a trillion, you know, uh, I don't know how many, uh, you know, zeros is that, but a trillion, million, trillion dollars uh, of, of subsidies in order to basically replace the infrastructure of water and sanitation in the country. So, so this means that uh, not even a country that the U.S. has been able to uh, to uh, keep the, the capital maintenance cost. So, so to, to me, the, you, know, the, uh, you know, obviously this can we say, well, then we cannot do anything, or we can say the other thing. Part of, of, the, of the reason why this has not worked is because the level of services probably have been wrong in many, in many cases, and, and, and particularly in small towns and communities, when the, the systems are provided for free because basically people try to get things that uh, later on cannot afford to operate and, and, uh, and maintain. So, so again, I think from uh, you know the, the beauty of this exercise that I looks like many people are going to be doing in their countries is can we put these costs in, in perspective and then let's educate not only the people but especially the politicians to see hey you know maybe we have to charge more you know to the people who have not been paying for for quite some time in order to you know really help the system to function and and and, and if, if anybody needs help you know might be you know people in in the you know very urban areas very poor or, or in the rural areas but still i think uh, you know like katarina said i mean most of the systems they will have to work and and, and maintain by themselves because it's very far too to reach so uh, thank you and i will stop here Okay, thank you very much, uh, Ventura. So now let me um, close the session uh, just briefly by, by giving thanks to everybody. And again, our facilitators did a magnificent job. Um, and we also uh, have special thanks to Su Jung, who has been masterminding the, the session, um, running the Adobe Connect software behind the scenes. But of course, a huge uh, thank you to Katerina and Ventura for the remarks. This has been our best attended webinar uh, yet, although I think you are probably building upon the excellent webinars we've had up to now and that there is a slowly growing constituency for our webinars. Let me assure you all, as you have some, some of you have been asking, that you will uh, be getting an email that will have a green button that looks like this that says, get more information. And if you click on that, you will be taken to the web page, which not only gives you the recording of this webinar, but also the PowerPoint and any related uh, documents. Um, Su Jung, I see you've given them the link to our webinar, uh, to our website page, but could you also give them the link to register to the, uh, to the, re to the system, to, sorry, re register to the series, because we'd like to ensure that we can continue to send you these informative emails again and again. Um, next week's webinar, I think, is going to be every bit as good. We have a, a team from Grundfos presenting their LifeLink um, system that some of you may be uh, familiar with. It's, it makes use of ICT technology for both uh, billing and payment and monitoring, uh, in addition to using solar technology. So we're very fortunate to have the managing director of Grundfos as well as the head of their technical department and the managing uh, or general director is, um, from LifeLink in Kenya. 
please uh, promote, help us to promote this webinar series. It's more fun the more of you we get online. Sean is doing an excellent job of uh, tweeting. Katerina is a great tweeter too, but please, uh, we'd, we'd appreciate the um, help of all of you. And with that, I will close and hope to see you, so to speak, quote, see you, unquote, see you next uh, Tuesday. Goodbye.